Welcome to Amplify. On this episode, I'll have a conversation with Dave Evans, the Accreditation Manager for AMP, and our conversation will provide an overview of the QP accreditation programs. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, Dave, welcome to Amplify. Thank you, Jim. I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to have you as well. Hey, for the viewers, if you could do me a favor, um, you are the uh, accreditation manager for the QP program. Could you go into a little bit of detail as what you do as the accreditation manager? Well, actually, Jim, thank you. I uh, oversee the program as far as the day-to-day operation of it. Um, I take a look at a lot of the audit material, especially if there's um, things that are in question or that we need to discuss and where, where we're going to recommunicate with the customer as to a finding or something like that. But uh, primarily oversight and administration and actual uh, review of standards and stuff like that. So for the viewers, what I'd like to do, uh, and Dave, you know this history already. I want to go way, way back um, in the mid-80s and talk about the, the origins of the, the QP. At that time, it was a certification program, uh, and, and today it is now an accreditation program that's expanded uh, dramatically over the, over the decades here. Uh, in the mid-1980s, um, at that time, Dave, you're well aware that we were talking about industrial paint. We really exactly. weren't into the advanced nature of coding systems and technologies that we see today. So the industry had, uh, through SSPC, uh, wanted to come up with uh, consensus standards on how to qualify and what they call in the qualification procedures on you know, field contractors that are performing industrial painting work on marine and industrial structures. So in, in 1986, a, uh, a group of... Uh, a committee was formed, and it was represented very well in the industry at that time with the facility owners, asset owners, uh, the industrial paint manufacturers, um, other third parties, and especially the contractors. Uh, a lot of the drive to this was the contractors to kind of help clean up uh, the industry and to eliminate a lot of the, let's call them bad actors at that time, um, who were doing poor quality work. And, and really, when it came to performance, it just wasn't quite there. So the uh, standard uh, QP1, which is a qualification procedures number one, dealing with the industrial painting contractor qualifications procedures, was established uh, roughly around 1986, 87 timeframe. Uh, when we got into 1989, the uh, contractors pushed real hard and the industry pushed real hard on SSPC to uh, start the QP uh, certification program, again, at that time, now an accreditation program. And that was to go and have uh, contractors that do field work, apply for the program, um, qualify into the program, but then go through an, an audit process. And then every year go through audit and reviews and things like that. But behind the standard itself was created this, this uh, program where it had um, integrity built into it, ethics built into it, performance built into it, quality built into it. And then a disciplinary action criteria that ultimately came out uh, and onto the program in the early 90s. Uh, in 1990, the first contractor was uh, at that time, again, certified, today accredited uh, in, in, the, in the nomenclature that we use uh, for the program today. The standards uh, from there started to expand. In your opinion and, and your experience in the industry, you know how monumental of a change was this QP1 standard and then the QP program itself? Well, I think it was uh, monu not only monumental, but I think it has and it's continued to be kind of the flagship program for quality in our industry. And, uh, you know, as you and I have discussed before many times, it, it will continue to be as AMP continues to uh, expand the program, uh, continue to build on those standards to do nothing but improve the quality of the program and the product that we're delivering to the to our customers. And today, roughly, there are about uh, roughly about ten uh, QP related type of uh, programs. Uh, one being a quality a QS program, which deals with the quality system, um, and that that can be achieved on top of a, an existing QP. Um, some of the programs that came out of the consensus standards, like I say, there's these existing consensus standards that were developed and they go through periodic review. The key ones um, really originated in, in the beginnings of the 90s as we moved into um, lead regulations, especially domestically here in the States. 
again, I know hazardous coatings are an issue globally, but uh, definitely domestically here uh, when we start getting into uh, 92, 93 timeframe and the lead loss. So from that, uh, QP2 was born and that was dealing with obviously qualification of contractors that would remove hazardous coatings and typically hazardous coatings, let's say lead paint. Uh, and then also how they would contain that, how they would protect the workers, um, the general public, and then also the environment as well. That um, particular program was very monumental because, again, it tied in the regulations that were coming out. And as the program, uh, when it comes to regulations, as uh, regulations change, these programs in these standards can be, um, they're very um, uh, dynamic where they can adjust with new technologies, um, with current trends in the industry, best practices, and things like that. Um, from the uh, existing programs that are out there, the, the key ones that I'd like to focus on is the, um, we just talked about the QP2. Uh, QP3, it deals with the blast and paint shops, um, but it's also based off a joint industry standard with the AISC, the American Institute of Steel Construction. And, um, you know, when you're looking at consensus documents like a standard and even a program like QP and then uh, AISC has a sophisticated paint endorsement, um, um, how challenging or how, how much of an opportunity, in your opinion, is there when you collaborate with other organizations, let's say, on joint standards? Well, I think there's always an opportunity. In the case of AISC with the sophisticated paint endorsement, it's worked very, very well uh, both ways. I think for both societies, as far as uh, improving quality uh, performance in shops, especially depending, doesn't matter if it's a sophisticated paint endorsement or the QP3 uh, accreditation at this point. I think that we've had very good acceptance and will continue to. And there's always opportunity to, to improve working with uh, the membership of both societies. So I, I think we, we will continue to I know we're going to continue to uh, foster that relationship and grow through, grow jointly through that type of uh, atmosphere, so to speak. And the reason why I highlight that is that, um, you know, accreditation programs are, are critical um, for the industry. Obviously, they have quality in mind, but they're also there to protect the asset owner uh, and the facility owner, but generally overall, the whole industry. Uh, the other programs, too, that uh, right now were very um let's call them popular, uh, is uh, QP5, which deals with the qualifications of inspection firms. And, uh, you know, over the last number of years, we've seen a number of uh, key firms obtain uh, that. And um, what I always viewed about the QP5, and, and, and I'd like to get your opinion on as well, this works out very well for the asset owner and also for the facility owner, where now not only can they have a process and procedure that they can integrate when it comes to the qualification of contractors or blast and paint shops, but now also too, they can tie in the inspection firm and kind of in a way um, weave into a, a total package when it comes to uh, project work. Um, what do you think about the QP5? I, well, uh, to go along with the scenario that you just painted, I, you're exactly correct. For the asset owner, uh, specifying QP1, QP2, just as an example, which are the two most popular, as you know. And then QP5 gives the asset owner uh, a heightened level of assurance that that uh, coding job is going to be delivered in accordance with the specification that they've had developed. Uh, you know, having that peace of mind, so to speak, that can be delivered by specifying QP1, QP2, and then QP5 for the inspection firm not only provides, as you know, a degree of documentation and, uh, in the, and a paper trail that is almost unprecedented in the industry. And uh, from an asset owners, it's just uh, one more, uh, I guess, peace of mind that, that puts to bed that the fact that whether we're going to end up with a quality coatings job or not, it really, really provides that kind of assurance. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, further on in our conversation, we're going to be talking about the value add to the owner, which would in include what you're talking about, that peace of mind, let's say. The, uh, the other thing, too, in today's, let's say, the today's contracting world, especially when it comes to protective coatings globally, um, the, the programs, obviously, for QP accreditation, they are global programs, by the way. And, um, you know, they um, 
we're talking about individual programs, but a lot of times what we find is we have field contractors that do work. Uh, sometimes they even have shop operations. Sometimes they do metallizing. Sometimes they do co- work on concrete. And, and sometimes they have the requirement for a ho- higher quality system when it comes to certain customers that they work with. Um, from the modernization of this industry. Uh, now, for example, uh, QP6 deals with uh, metallizing or thermal spray that could be done in shops or in the field. And we're seeing a lot of that combination being done. Uh, QP8 deals with the qualification of uh, concrete uh, coatings and other type of cementitious uh, uh, type of uh, uh, preparation and surface treatments and things like that. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I wanted to cover was uh, the QS1. For the QS1 dealing with the quality system, and, and you, can, you can correct me if, if I have this wrong opinion, I always viewed it not to compare us, um, this program with like an ISO you know, type of audit, but when we look at the QS1 for the quality system, that accreditation really requires a little bit more in-depth uh, audit of process, the procedures, and also looking at the acceptance and the culture within the organization that the quality is of mind. Is that how you view it as well? Exactly. I look at QS1 as, as a higher level of acceptance. It actually, in my mind, uh, establishes a, a higher level of excellence at, uh, for the, as a standard. So that yeah, an owner that specif- or has a project or a need for a QS1 quality type standard is expecting a different level of excellence out of the applicator than what you normally would um, on a project not requiring. So in a, in a, f- a future episode, uh, in a short term here, we'll be talking about the, the audit process that goes on the initial audit and then annual audits that are performed. The uh, interesting thing when we look at the um, accreditation program, let's say versus where you have someone coming in and doing an ISO audit. An ISO audit, they're looking at process, paperwork, procedures. For a QP accreditation audit, we're looking at that to some extent, but we're really watching and observing, inspecting, documenting, and then also um, making sure that the practice is done properly in the field. Um, Could you cover a little bit about um, the field audits that are done? Or well, shop I, audits too. I, yeah, briefly. Uh, when when I, the way I view this is, is when you take a look at a normal ISO audit, it does a great job of. Uh, I equate it to the medical industry. We have a cold or or we have the flu or something. We may go see a general practitioner, but if I've you know if I need a surgeon, I'm probably going to go see a specialist or something like that. And so the the uh, quality audit, the QS standard takes it one step further and specifically audits uh, items that are pertinent to our industry. So, you know, where you may have an an ISO audit that takes a look at the overall quality of the operation, meaning the process, and it could be uh, a fabrication shop or, you know, it, it could be some other kind of organization that has a process that they go through for manufacturing tires or something like that we're still roughly reviewing the same kind of stuff on a general basis. When you get to the QS1 audit, we're looking at things that are specifically purposed in the industrial coatings business. So we're taking it another step and really probably two steps because when you take a look at, you know, uh, QP1, you know, we're still doing an audit, but it's not as focused as a QS1 audit is. So it's, it's just another step in the spe- and the auditor is looking for a greater degree of detail that's related specifically to our industry. So for AMP's practice, when it comes to working with uh, owners, uh, engineers, and specification firms that work in and around, obviously, coding specifications and project requirements, we do um, educate and provide information to them to let them know that not in addition to maybe, let's say, um, putting in one program, you need to really consider looking at your entire, uh, let's say, corrosion and coating strategy and looking to integrate multiple QP requirements. To your point earlier, you have, a, let's say, for example, you have QP1. Um, you should consider looking at the aspect of a, a QP5 inspection firm. And again, kind of tying everything together. Um, and again, if you're doing shop work, QP3, if you're metallizing, QP6, 
uh, if you're doing concrete work, QP8. And then if you are a, a particular uh, owner that really requires a higher quality system, uh, then you can look at requiring a QS-1. Uh, the um, And we have uh, global uh, contractors and, and shops and, in, and other firms that do hold one or multiple um, accreditations. You know, the, the thing uh, that I like to also kind of stress and get your opinion on as well, myself being legacy SSPC coming and working at AMP uh, and then also um, working uh, with the QP programs, I've always viewed it as a kind of a partnership. And what I mean by that is it, it, is, it really requires the contractors, the owners and the asset owners, and also AMP to collaborate and work together. In, in your experience with uh, being the program manager, have you seen great examples of that collaboration? I have. And <clears throat> I couldn't agree with you more, Jim, that our position is that we want to work with everybody. A, a collaborative effort, uh, both with a contractor and with the owner, especially when you, when you have the opportunity to uh, work with a, a contractor, for example, and, uh, you know, they're interested in improving their quality process. Our auditor's position is one of being, um, to use the word mentor, you know, not uh, provide a guide through the process, but to certainly to advise them what they could do to uh, achieve the, help achieve the accreditation if they needed to make an improvement or something like that. We're very collaborative in our nature because that's the way that uh, everybody's going to grow together. You know, we're a firm believer that it takes a village to accomplish uh, the, uh, the movement of the accreditation program and make it valuable for everybody. Uh, you know, when you were mentioning, and, and not to belabor a point, you were exactly correct earlier when uh, you were talking about contractors holding multiple uh, different QP accreditations. There's a value to them also when they do that for the simple reason is it opens up many, many other opportunities for them to differentiate themselves against their competitors. And that's also a value to the owner. Well, AMP is, is all about providing values to both the contractor and to the owner uh, for the value of the certificate or the accreditation, excuse me. So when we talk about, we use the word disciplinary, it usually never means a, a positive thing, but the, the QP accreditation programs have uh, built in um, since the nineties and, and uh, uh, they are, you know, revised obviously with changes in the industry and obviously with ethics and other best practices, a disciplinary action criteria does exist. Now, the, the DAC, as we like to call it here at AMP, um, is not viewed as a, um, a sledgehammer on a contractor. Um, it is really an effective tool to let the contractors know that they need to adhere to the program. And then obviously, the owners have an opportunity or a vehicle to communicate with AMP if they're having any you know, issues or challenges or concerns. Uh, but then also, too, if there's any type of uh, ethics violations, if there's any type of uh, uh, major um, safety, environmental, um, regulatory type of uh, issues uh, that might uh, might come down uh, through the through uh, review and the, and the other type of legal, let's say, aspects of things. Um, could you talk a little bit about the disciplinary action criteria, how you view it uh, being the program manager? Well, I view it as an opportunity to work with our customers to for improvement. Uh, you know, I was just quickly thinking while you were asking the question about a billboard I saw when I was driving down to, I'm in Houston this morning, and it, it was uh, advertisement for a legal firm, and they had a lawyer with a sledgehammer up on the, on the billboard saying, well, this is how we're going to deal with this particular type of uh, opportunity. And that is not what DAC is about. DAC is more of a collaborative, as to use what we were talking about before, collaborative effort on AMP's part to help rectify a situation that's been identified to the benefit of both the owner and the contractor as we work through it to make it in compliance with the program. Now, you mentioned the ethical part of it. And it, this is one thing I want to make sure that we uh, that the listeners understand is that this is not a one step, you know, bang on the top of the head and you're done type program. It is anything but that, you know, there's a, an ethical piece that if there's a ethical complaint, 
that's invested by investigated by a completely separate arm that is separate from QP, and that that applies to the whole AMP organization. But then, if there's uh, something that's headed down the path of you know a finding or multiple findings or something like that, uh, the QP program are, is going to work diligently with the contractor to try and get those things resolved in a timely basis so that they go away, that they're resolved forever. The idea here is not to remove an accreditation ever if we don't have to. You know, that is absolutely the avenue of last resort. And, uh, you know, there's a long and very, very detailed communication process that occurs long before that ever happens. So uh, just just to be perfectly clear, it's it's certainly not once. You know, one strike and you're out. That's not it at all. So, well, it's a very, uh, a very, you know, fair. Um, and then to your point about going through all the legalities, let's say the legal process and everything like that. Um, you know, there's uh, really a lot to look at in a disciplinary uh, program. But like, like you said, it's really not to uh, sledgehammer them, but it's just basically to help remind um, everybody that uh, compliance is important. And then also uh, the program is about continuous improvement. Exactly. If I could add one thing, you know, you brought up the legal part of it. You know, we certainly operate on the premise that you're innocent until proven guilty. There's so many things, as you well know, that you hear in the marketplace about this, that, or the other thing. We take a posture that, uh, you know, we're going to investigate everything and that there's, you know, two sides to every story. Probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. And what we try and do is work diligently to achieve that by communicating with the contractor, getting all the facts, and then putting together an improvement program that works through the issue if we can. I mean, there's some things that are certainly out of our hands, but, you know, with the majority of them where we can have an influence to make things better, we're absolutely going to take that posture. Hey, Dave, let's go ahead and talk about the value-added benefits for asset owners and facility owners uh, with QP accreditation, you know, putting in the specification. You know, uh, the, the specify the programs, there is no cost uh, to the uh, asset owner or the facility owner to specify not only one, but multiple QP accreditations. What, when it comes to the accreditation, uh, putting in the spec, um, what advice do you have for owners? Well, you know, and there's a lot of, you hear a lot of noise around the industry that it actually costs asset owners uh, money to specify any one of the QP accreditations. And what I'd like to say is probably in regard to that is two things. One is that uh, when you take a look at the long-term performance of a, a bid that included a, a QP requirement, chances are the length of that coding life, the extended service life received by the owner is going to be much greater than on projects where uh, they don't require a QP accredited contractor. The second thing is, is that we certainly understand the low bid principle. The only thing that I'd like to add to that is, is that owners should take a look at accepting the lowest qualified bid because that will make a real difference in the quality of the project that you get. Uh, QP, uh, the Q, achieving the QP accreditation by a contractor uh, indicates that they've uh, met a standard that certainly defines a high level of quality and meeting the requirements of any one of the QP standards and allows them to differentiate themselves against other um, operations that have not been able to uh, achieve that accreditation. So I, I think that's you know, really important to consider both of those items. So the, the other benefit that, in my opinion, is, is very powerful for facility owners and asset owners is the qualification when you're looking at not only the training of the craft workers, um, but the qualification and the certification. Um, not only when it comes to surface prep uh, coding application, um, or even on the quality system, when you're looking at the quality assurance uh, work that is done, you know, when you're looking at the uh, QP accreditations, could you provide a little bit more um, information regarding to what the auditor, let's say, is looking for uh, that would be important to the asset owner when it comes to uh, craft worker and then inspection on the QA side? 
Well, certainly when and with a QP audit, regardless, let's just say QP1 or QP2, the things that the auditor's looking for there is that the that the either the applicator or the blaster has met uh, and the crew supervisor has met certain qualifications that are listed within the standard that they're verifiable and that they that they have a proven degree of performance when uh, it comes to meeting the standard. Additionally, the other things they're looking about is that they look at complexity of the crew, meaning you know within the QP various QP standards there are requirements for the number of qualified workers that have to be present on the crew and the auditor is out making sure that that the contractor is providing those type of trained individuals on the specific project that we're working on to make sure that we meet the requirements not only of the QP standard but of the specification also you know, for the uh, owner, facility owners and asset owners that are, are viewing this episode, um, the AMP is uh, not an association of which would say just put in the spec and then we, we kind of, you know, go through and, and do our process. You know, we do work with the facility owner and the asset owner when it comes to um, not really writing their specification, but we do give them some sample um, language they can put into their specification, uh, into their job notification when it comes to contractors. Um, anything, um, any additional insights that you would like to add to the asset owners or facility owners when it comes to what they should incorporate in addition to the QP requirement uh, into uh, specification and, and project bid work? Well, first and foremost, uh, the language, you know, especially in, in North America that goes into a specification can be, it has to be very, very exact. And a lot of times when you're writing in something like one of the QP standards, Having that verbiage correct can be difficult. We're more than happy to provide a sample verbiage for that an engineer owner, uh, contract specifier can write into a, a spec each step of the way to make sure that you are um, that your verbiage is correct, that what you're specifying is exactly what you want, so it provides the outcome that you're the intended outcome that you're looking for. Uh, we're more than happy to help with that. And definitely, and also too, looking at this on a global basis. Um, for example, we might have international owners that, you know, again that we might have to um, have uh, uh, the uh, the language might be need to be different because of uh, um, their regulations and then their their business laws and things like that. So that's a good point to bring up that uh, you know it's not a one size fits all, but you know having the basics and looking at it, making sure that. Uh, the standard is specified, uh, the program requirement is specified, uh, that's key and important. And then in addition to that, you know, looking at that comprehensively, how to communicate that within your organization, uh, that everyone knows that um, the um, you as an owner, an asset owner, you're requiring QP, uh, and then what it, it entails with that. And, and Dave, I know you're readily available, I'm readily available, many at AMP are readily available to help asset owners and facility owners in the process. Uh, and again, work with contractors as well, because to your point, um, there are customers and, and we, this is what we do uh, for the industry. Exactly. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself, Jim. We, we are absolutely here to, yeah, and your point internationally is very well taken. As you well know, one of our uh, uh, objectives is to expand the QP program on a global basis. A lot of that is working culturally uh, in other countries to make sure that, uh, you know, a lot, of, when you said the one size fits all uh, model, you're exactly right. One size does not fit all. Different, in, different regulations, different requirements, owners trying to accomplish different things and projects are different too. We're here to help. That's what we do. I mean, we, we can and will help. With a with a language thing, Dave. Let's go ahead and move on to the advantages that QP provides uh, for contractors, uh, paint shops, and also inspection firms. As you know, the majority there are a high number of, of contractors who and shops and inspection firms that do obtain a QP accreditations uh, because of they need to be in compliance with the owner or the asset owners specification to have a QP. In addition to really the compliant, becoming into compliance with it, 
What are some of the other reasons that we have a number, a fair number of contractor shops and inspection firms that do obtain accreditation through QP? Well, the other side of the coin is for a lot of contractors is, is that they want to take their companies and, and differentiate themselves against other competitors. And the QP process can be an arduous one. As you and I both know that, um, you know, initially it, it's a lot of looking at your company and, and uh, looking at the QP standard, the audit criteria, and making sure all the parts and pieces are in place, and then actually practicing for a while to make sure that your operations work that way. But what happens is, is you find that a lot of contracting companies, you know, take it one step beyond and say, you know, initially I wanted to do it because I wanted to chase that kind of work. It was a, it was opportunistic. Now it's turned into, we want our companies to achieve those kind of quality standards. So we operate that way. And then, and then in turn, what they see is, is that, they're able to bid a lot of different kinds of work because essentially the doors are open to them. So when we look at achieving accreditation, let's talk about on the contractor's side. This gives the contractor an opportunity to really look internally at improvements they can make. And, and obviously, there's going to be some investment. They're going to have to invest some time and, and money, resources into craft workers, um, their inspection team when it comes to quality uh, quality control, and and then also to business practices internally. Many contractors have specifically talked to you and, and to myself uh, about uh, savings and uh, time gains that they've got efficiencies. Let's say with QP, you know, in your opinion, do you view QP accreditation as a potential way for an operation to really improve themselves and impact their bottom line? Absolutely. I think that it, by achieving a QP accreditation, uh, maybe not initially because you've got to go through the arduous process of putting the, the pieces and parts in place, but once you get there, that's you see many of the QP accredited contractors, even if it's not a QP job that they're working on, still operate by the same means because of the efficiencies gained because of the process. And that relates directly to the bottom line. Hours saved, you know, uh, the safety issues, the quality, you know, you've got to have a quality manual, you've got to have all of the training of your workers. They become much more efficient and their profitability uh, improves dramatically. You know, Dave, on this topic, I think we could probably do another half hour or more Absolutely. If you could do me a favor, what I'd like to do is bring you back on the next episode. And I'd like you and I have a conversation on, on related to the contractors and, and, the, and the paint shops and the inspection firms, the, the application process. And we'll focus, I think, more on the audit checklist uh, and the audit process itself. And in this way, we could provide a lot more in-depth information uh, for the contractors, uh, again, paint shops and inspection firms when it comes to the process and procedures as either, we'll take it from the aspect of the initial application, you know, someone looking to obtain it for the first time. And then also we could probably cover the annual audit as well. Is, is that okay with you? It's absolutely perfect. I'd love to do it. And I welcome the opportunity, Jim. Excellent. Excellent. And then for those viewing um, the uh, standards that I did cover, um, I will do links uh, to the marketplace where if you wanted to purchase um, or uh, purchase, download the uh, standards to take a look at them. Um, I will make that. I also put links uh, for the program information as well uh, for the viewers uh, in the, in the video description on YouTube. Um, Dave, great conversation. In closing, is there anything that we didn't talk about on these topics that you would want to leave with the viewers? No, outside of the fact that uh, achieving the QP accreditation will help your business. It really will. And it will improve the, for the owners. It'll improve the quality of the, of the end result product that you're getting. I'm very thankful that you asked me to participate this morning, Jim, and uh, I, I look forward to the next opportunity. Uh, it's great, great to have you. And again, for the viewers, um, what I'd like to do also, too, is remind you to make sure to like, uh, share this video, and subscribe to the AMP YouTube channel. In addition to that, make sure that you do join the AMP LinkedIn uh, group and also follow us on Facebook and other social media. 
Um, Amplify will have additional content coming out as uh, video content. And also we'll be moving into live streaming on different platforms. Um, Dave, thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. It really has. Hey, have a great day. You too, sir. Please like and share this video. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank <laughs> you.